administrator in the Boston school system and a former speechwriter uh, for former um, Mayor Tom Menino. Um, Chris, do you want the Please. answer? Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Okay, on sound, can you folks hear me? Great. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Um, nice to see some, some uh, familiar faces, but I know a lot of folks in the room are new to the role. How many of you are new school committee members? Great. And how many veterans? Nice. Nice mix. So, um, I, a couple of housekeeping things first. I will send this deck to Tim so you guys will have access to the slides. Um, Tim mentioned a few things. Um, I live in Massachusetts now. I have for a long time. I'm in the Boston area, but I'm from Pawtucket originally. Any Pawtucket folks in the room? All right, right up front, nice. Um, and as Tim mentioned, I spent the first part of my career working for the city of Boston, first for the mayor's office, and then for the school committee, and then for a couple of different superintendents. And I say that in part because I think that experience of having worked with all three entities really shaped how I do this work. And a lot of what I'm going to share with you today about roles and responsibilities and what they mean for communications. Um, so part of that is about what I have seen work well when people sort of stay in their lane, whether you're the town official, town or city official, the superintendent or the school board member, and also what has not gone as well when folks wander out of their lane. And I'm sure that's come up in a lot of your conversations today about sort of what is the role that you are in and how do you play it well. So I worked for the Boston Public Schools for about 12 years. My last role was as chief communications officer. I was the first person in that job. Um, the job did not exist and we really reinvented the communications function while I was in the district, um, in part because of the leadership of our school committee president who was really passionate about that and felt that we were not doing a great job of being proactive in telling our story. And the Boston Public Schools was always playing defense. And we spent our day often by starting off saying, OK, wonder what the Globe and the Herald want to kick our butts about today, um, and spending the day playing defense and catch up on that. And what we tried to do was to sort of turn those tables and say, yeah, we're still going to be fending off the Globe and Herald and 4, 5, 7, 25, and everybody else. But at the same time, what are we doing to tell our own story? What are we doing to get other news out there so that people don't only hear and see all the stuff that is negative in the Boston Public Schools. So that was a really powerful experience. In 2010, I went off and started my own company, Horan Communications. Those of you who are still on Twitter, <laughs> our numbers are dwindling, but I uh, invite you to join me there. I'm still on the fence about whether I'm going to jump ship or not, but sticking around for now. Um, in 2010, I started my own firm, and now I work primarily with K-12 districts and nonprofits in education, mostly here in New England and others around the country. Okay. So that's sort of the little background so you know sort of what, where I'm coming from. When I work with districts, as Tim mentioned, some of it is crisis communication. A district will call me and say, something's hitting the fan or about to hit the fan. We need your help either cleaning up some bad, bad press or getting ahead of a story, which is obviously preferable. Um, and in other cases, they are coming to me for proactive help because they, the school committee, the superintendent, whomever, want to do a better job telling their story and do a better job getting out good news stories or sharing with the public some of the challenges they're facing, but really trying to be more proactive instead of that reactive mode that I think we in K-12 often find ourselves. Okay? So my work is really a mix of both, and I'm going to address both today. So focusing on the school committee, the question I often get is, you know, we're a school committee, we are passionate about communication. And sometimes they'll say, our superintendent is passionate about communication too. Other times they'll say, he or she doesn't get it. We're always trying to get him or her to do a better job of communication, and we're always the ones saying, let's get good news out there. Let's do a better job of X, Y, and Z. So a lot of times it's about trying to sort of navigate that terrain and help school committees who are passionate and want to see better work in this area make a difference without stepping outside their roles that you've been hearing about. I think you started your day talking about roles and responsibilities. Um, before I get into that, let's give you a little pop quiz from this morning and what you've learned today. What are those key roles and responsibilities that you heard about for school committees? What's in your lane? Policy, budget, what else? Superintendent hiring and evaluation. Oh, what do you mean by oversight? <laughs> Sorry? Ah, 
So policy in general, but also making sure that they don't just adopt them, but are they adhered to, do they need to be updated, that kind of thing. Great, what else? I hear something else? Budget, policy, budget, superintendent. Firing, firing, firing all those superintendent related things. Just firing whom? That's what I mean, yes. All things to do with the superintendent. Hiring, evaluation, his or her professional development, all that good stuff. Any other things we've talked about before? Yes. Yep, all a part of your budget. Um, fiscal responsibility all falls into that. Anything else? Yep. Ah, so some special projects. Partially a fiscal responsibility, but also goes beyond that. So certainly Rhode Island's had this surge of building projects with, with the new state law and funding around that, and school committees have played a very active role in that. So that's another good one. Anything else? Okay. Yes? Provide a safe environment for children's learning. Provide a safe environment. So say more about the school committee's role in particular in that issue. Policy and budget, right? <laughs> Just like anything else, you staying in your lane, whether it's about safety or any other topic, making sure that the superintendent has the funds that they need to do this job well with their team, that the policies are aligned so that safety is a priority and so on. Okay, good. I think we covered most of them. There might be one or two others. So thinking about that, what are the roles that you see the school committee playing in keeping with those lanes in effective communication for your district. What are some of the ways that you think you all can influence how your, your district communicates with its constituents? So sometimes the question is, who is the spokesperson on this issue? Whether it's the spokesperson at a public meeting, uh, with Channel 10 News, with whomever. Um, and figuring out that appropriate role is a really good point. Sometimes it's a very specific school thing. Sometimes it's important for the principal especially if that principal is known and trusted by the staff and families and students to be the one, the face of that issue and to explain what's happening. Other times it may be the superintendent. But on other occasions, if it's within that lane, budget, policy, or about the superintendent, maybe one or two other things, then it is appropriate. And only then is it appropriate for the school committee to serve as the spokesperson on this issue, right? And I think we've seen cases where sometimes an issue becomes so elevated um, that the school committee sometimes feels like then it's appropriate for them to be a spokesperson on this. And I would say the same rule applies. If it's not in your lane, it is still the superintendent's job to manage that crisis. So here's a role of responsibility we didn't even talk about at the beginning, about the big picture, that the school committee and the superintendent and the whole team develop some kind of plan, strategic plan, district plan, um, to chart a course for your district. You decide on your vision, your mission, your purpose, those big picture goals. And your point is, how are we going to measure those goals? How are we going to hold ourselves and our team accountable? That is very much a school committee responsibility and an opportunity for you to communicate with the public about the adoption of all of that stuff, but also those regular updates about, we said we would increase literacy rates in grade four by X in three years. Well, now three years are up or we're at year two. How are we doing on that? That's a really important for you and the superintendent in conjunction with one another to play. Great example. Others, how else can the school committee support effective communication in your district? Yes? By running um, efficient and accessible meetings. Ah, by running efficient and accessible meetings. You guys just heard a lot about Open Meeting Act. And yes, that is an important communication opportunity. And what I often say to the, the districts I work with is that can either make you guys look really good and your district look really good, or it can make you look really bad. And sometimes it's a little mix of both. So that is a communications moment, whether someone's in the room, watching it on Zoom, watching it on cable TV, the way that you all communicate in those meetings says something about how you operate as a district. Great example. Others? Yes. Yes, so subcommittee reports, workshops, any of those ways that the school committee convenes people, engages in the work, not just in those monthly or bi-monthly business meetings, but all of those ways that you wanna make sure the public doesn't say, I don't know what goes on behind closed doors over there. I know there's some policy subcommittee, they just voted, but I have no idea. 
That's not the reputation you want in terms of transparency. What other roles and responsibilities did we talk about at the very beginning that we haven't talked about in terms of what they mean for communication? Talked about the big picture. What else? <laughs> I remember. Nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. And um, for it, it having somebody responsible for it yeah. at the district and then at the school level, and we just struggle with getting that person. Get, yeah. You know, it's a part, part of it. I think is a financial thing. I mean, Ooh. where we have good updated content, there is a staff member who is gets a stipend for doing that. Um, we don't have anybody at the district level that I know of that yeah. has been identified. As So this, let's. As a school committee member, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, you can only complain about it so much. <laughs> or say, what do we need? Tell us, you know, tell the school. I want somebody to tell the committee what they need to get this done. Whose job is that, to tell the committee what they need to get this done? Yes. No, really, I'm asking you, whose job is that? Superintendent. The superintendents, right? Apply board on it. It's not your job to go fix that. So the question is, what levers do you need to pull short of just telling the superintendent to make that happen? You alluded to some of them, but let me turn to others. What are some of those levers you have? To listen, that's an important point. That's great. I love those examples. But I also want to caution you all a little bit, because I think there's this sort of fine line between being out in the community and doing the listening you're describing. I love the fact that you are visible and that people are, know who you are as, as school committee members, puts a face on it. But at the same time, we also have to educate the public about what your role is and isn't. And I think sometimes the, the, you know, the public may just say, oh, well, they're the superintendent's boss. So whatever it is I can't get done from him or her, I'll just go to his bosses or her bosses, the school committee. No matter how m much that, is, that need or request or problem is in the weeds, they don't understand that that's not your job, that you are focused on policy and budget and the big picture and superintendent hiring and evaluation and so on. So I like that notion. I just want to caution you about always doing so with some caveats for the public so they don't, aren't misled about why you are there. So let me get back to the question, just using the website as an example, not to get down the rabbit hole of websites. But what are the levers you pull? So I asked you guys at the beginning, what are your roles and responsibilities? Budget, policy, superintendent evaluation, big picture. How do you pull those levers to be more effective communicators, to help the district communicate more effectively? Yes? Well, I would make that a goal of the superintendent. Make that a goal of the superintendent. This is why you have an evaluation, right? You have a rubric that presumably lays out all the expectations for how that job should be performed. And every year, presumably, you go through an exercise to rate that person in their job performance. And if something is as important as communication, and maybe it's as granular as doing a better job on the website, whatever, put it in there. 
and evaluate based on that. What other levers? Good, good one. What other levers? There you go. Right? So whether it's social media, whether it's um, so it's kind of like I am a superintendent, this is what we like, come up with a plan, then it's for us using our fiscal authority to say, okay, this is how we're gonna fund it or not. Absolutely. So that's another really important lever, and probably the best lever you have in your toolkit to be able to say, we believe so passionately that we need a new website. You need to go and tell us what it's going to cost, put together a proposal, and we're going to put our money where our mouth is. And if you don't pony up for a web designer, developer, whether it's for a short-term project or long-term maintenance, then the superintendent can say, don't look at me. You guys didn't give me the money. Conversely, you can say, we put up the money you needed for this. Where are the results? So there's the superintendent evaluation. There's budget. What else? Yes. Policy. What is it? Policy. Policy. Say more about that. What about policy? You can create policy. You can create policy. It's a rep. What's going to happen with your website, communication, all kinds of things? Yes. Again, you want to stay in your lane. You don't want to just say, well, we want this to happen, so we're going to call it a policy that the superintendent has to X, Y, and Z. And I'm sure you learned about a lot of. There's a process, yes. But you want to make sure that policy isn't just sort of operational directives disguised as policy either, because that's rather transparent. But I want to go, you brought up policy, and I want to start with that one, because it probably is one of the most important things that you all do. One of the first things that we did when I reinvented the communications function with my team for Boston Public Schools was we said, what is the school committee's role in this? And how do we want to make sure that they feel like they can have a hand in this without micromanaging communications in the district? And that's where we went, was to update, adopt, or, in, or maybe in some cases update, district policies related to effective communication. What kind of policies are those? What policies do you know of or have that are related to communication? So what we did was we adopted something that was purposely not way too much. We gave the school committee a one-page communications policy. Maybe it's a page and a half, but it's very high level. We realized that we always talk about what good communication should look like, but we as a district had never defined it. Um, when you guys get the handout, that little link at the bottom will take you to this policy so you can see it. It doesn't get into the minutia of like, what's our media relations policy? That exists somewhere else. It's not our social media policy. That lists somewhere else. Those need to exist somewhere else. This is more like, can we agree as a district, the school committee, the superintendent, and the team, that this is what good communication looks like, that families and citizens have a right to know what's occurring, that employees have an obligation to ensure the public is kept systematically and adequately informed. Again, this is not revolutionary, but it gives you some sort of touch point to go back to to say, are we adhering to this or not? They're sort of like norms, perhaps cloaked a little bit in policy. I really encourage you to adopt this or something like it. Another one, we talked about this, allocating sufficient resources, approving a budget for the district's communications function. Often this comes down to the question, as you mentioned, of personnel, right? Those are your biggest costs. And more and more districts are really wrestling with and deciding to hire someone full time in a district to be the communications person. That was not a thing when I started in this line of work. Only the biggest districts like Boston in Massachusetts could afford that or get away with it. Even mid-sized districts said, the public's gonna kill us. If we even pay that person a salary that looks like a teacher's salary, they're gonna say, why aren't you hiring a teacher? That is changing in the age of social media and media pressure and this just 24 seven news cycle, more and more districts and superintendents and school committees are saying, the heck with it, we'll take the hit. We've gotta have someone to manage our messaging, our social media accounts, our website content, and so on. Um, and I think it's really making a difference. Otherwise, what happens more often than not is the superintendent spends his or her time being the communications director. It's inefficient, it's unrealistic, and frankly, their time should be spent doing something else. Mm. Um, kind of yeah, great question. What's, how, what's communications? What's marketing? Uh, what's branding? I do a lot of work helping districts think about their brand. And some people, that word kind of makes them cringe because they think about, oh, that's the for-profit sector. That's all about 
Kellogg's and Volvo and everybody else who's trying to make a buck. And that's true to some extent, but I think there are lessons we can learn about branding and brands. Um, and the communications person, whatever their title is, should have a hand in that. I always thought of myself as sort of being involved in brand management, of what is the Boston Public Schools brand? And what are we doing to either supporting and enhancing that brand or detracting from that brand and reinforcing people's negative stereotypes about us? So I see the job in a perfect world as a mix of someone who gets marketing and communications, knows how to sell your district, especially to prospective parents and staff. Someone who knows something or two about, about brand and branding. Someone who can handle crisis communication and is ready to step up when things hit the fan. Um, a good writer. I mean, there's a lot of qualities you want in this person, but it's a job with a lot of hats. There's no question when it's done right. Okay. So we can come back to that um, if there's time, but certainly if you feel like communications is inefficient or uh, inadequate in your district, you have to examine with the superintendent what you are truly investing in communications and is it enough. What I always said is most districts that I know are multi-million dollar organizations. No other multi-million dollar organization I know of in the world would not have a communications person or budget to support an organization of that size. Even small nonprofits have a communications person because they know they need that to get their message out. Okay, three, we talked about this one. Rating communication skills as part of the superintendent's evaluation and offer professional development to help improve. So this isn't just giving him or her a one star, or five star, or something in between, but saying, if, it's, if you are not performing at the levels that we think you should, what do you need from us to do a better job? And that's sometimes where I come in. The school committee will say, we're not trying to micromanage you, but you need PD too. So can you go somewhere and get a coach or the training you need to be a more effective communicator and to build a more efficient and effective communications infrastructure? Four, and some, some of you alluded to this, including the gentleman from Providence, providing opportunities for family, staff, and community input and engagement, particularly on the things that are in your lane. Again, policy, budget, so on. Creating those opportunities to listen, and not just in public comment at school committee meetings, but really to listen. Um, I, I did a session for RIASC, I don't know when that was, called The Art of Listening, were any of you here for that? And it was very much about that, is how do we listen beyond those painful public comment periods at school committees that are not good for you, they're not good for the public, it's very stifling. How do you create other opportunities to, to, for the public to speak its mind, to share their questions, concerns, ideas, frustrations, um, and not to just be an us-them thing, but truly a conversation. And that's a really important role for you all to play. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it is tricky because Yes, in a perfect world, you would only get input and engagement on the things that you can control, but I do think there's space for a school committee to say, we are just convening. Um, we are creating opportunities for the public to weigh in about things that perhaps we can't do anything about from a policy or a budget standpoint, but we are bringing together the superintendent and the superintendent's team and teachers and principals and parents and students and other community members to have these conversations. One of the things, I've mentioned this in my session, but we had a school committee member in Boston who was so passionate about that, and she was rightfully so frustrated with our school committee meetings because they are just so lockstep that she created this community forum series. And she worked with the superintendent's office to do it, um, but really sort of drove it in the spirit of engagement and input from stakeholders. And I think she had, let's say, five per school year. And they decided at the beginning of the year what those topics would be. And maybe one was English learners, and another one was STEM education. Big sort of big topics, but they weren't about an upcoming vote or a, a decision to be made. They were just important issues that we wanted to create space to have those conversations. And what I really liked about it was she hired facilitators. And that facilitator may have started the session by just sort of giving the lay of the land on English language learners or STEM or whatever the topic happened to be. Just set the stage. And then most of the time in the session was spent at tables like this. And there was a school committee member, school committee member here, not running the show, but participating, a teacher, a student, a parent, a principal, whomever, having conversations that were facilitated and structured around certain guiding questions or whatever. But it wasn't this contentious, we're up here, you're down there, we'll gavel you when you're out of line, and you'll yell at us when you think we're terrible. It, all of that went away. It was truly conversations, true engagement. And there were notes taken, those notes were aggregated, shared back with the community. 
Um, it just to me was a really nice model of, I think, where we need to go with listening, where it's not just, yeah, we heard you, but we had a conversation about these things. Sure. OK. And then some others sort of alluded to this in, in a variety of ways, but serving as ambassadors, this is such an important piece, because I think people elect you in part for this reason. They want you to be their voice from the community back to the district. But I think it's also an opportunity for you to be the voice from the district back to the community and to share, again, the stuff that's in your lane. So all the stuff in your strategic plan or your district plan, those mission, the vision, the goals, the priorities, and then everything that the superintendent and the team put under that, the action steps, the tactics, the timelines. That, to me, is your roadmap. And it's the perfect stuff for you to be communicating out. Because it reminds the public that that is your domain, that big picture stuff, the where are we going? What does that look like? To me, it's about sharing with the public and even asking the public, what are our district's goals and how will we achieve them? So whether you're in the supermarket or a school or the playground or a school community, you're talking about these things, reminding people that you have set goals for yourselves as a district and you have strategies in place to achieve those goals. You've put money behind those strategies. And what are the district's challenges and how will we overcome them? There's probably a lot of overlap there too, as opposed to, oh, I'm gonna go micromanage that IEP or that choice for Thursday's lunch. Um, I'm exaggerating here, but you see the difference between sort of getting in the weeds and staying at the really high level. And your district or strategic plan is the perfect place to think about what that content looks like for you to be talking about. And I would argue, going back to your superintendent and saying, how are you using all the tools in your toolkit at your disposal to make sure the public is kept abreast of all this stuff. If I looked at your social media feeds, or your website, or I watched your school committee meetings, would I get my answer to these questions? Would I come away with a sense about what your big picture plan looks like, what your priorities are, what your goals are, what you're working on, and most importantly, how you're gonna get there? Or would I hear a lot of noise about personnel and your website has lots of other stuff, and your Twitter feed has some lovely great stories about a robotics fair and a snow day, but not a lot about the big picture. This is what I spend most of my time doing with districts on the proactive side, is helping them to sort of rise above all that noise and make sure you're telling your community about the big picture. Yes? We talk about some of these big picture things in the school community, which most people don't have. Right. I couldn't agree more. And if I had a nickel for every time I ask a superintendent, um, does the public know about this? And the answer I often get is, well, we talked about it at school committee. And I will say, with all due respect, I'm sure the eight people who watched that may have loved it. <laughs> or 80, if you're lucky, is still a drop in the bucket for districts of just about any size. So, and I think we check off the box. Like, I, it was in a presentation, it's on our website, just go watch the video, not gonna happen. How are we taking, if that imp information is important enough, how are we thinking about school community meetings as one tool in our toolkit, one of many? Social media, website, press, community meetings, neighborhood meetings, all these places for us to be, if it's important enough to be at the school committee, ask yourselves, how are we taking it on the road, as you said? Love that. Be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the communications responsibilities that you also have even in setting the agenda for school committee meetings, you're deciding sort of what's important and what you want the public to know is important to you as a body. Um, managing public meetings, you just heard a lot about that. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. Uh, coordinated school committee communication. So much of good communication starts or ends even within your group. How well do you communicate with one another? How well do you communicate with the superintendent and vice versa? Or is that dysfunctional? Because I guarantee if it's dysfunctional there, that's gonna trigger, trickle down to the whole district. So you guys being able to model what good communication looks like even among yourselves. And then as we talked about earlier on, serving as spokesperson, I have always believed in the, the school committee that I've worked with for the most part, I've always believed that the chairperson should act as the spokesperson. I know some people don't like that and they say, the chair doesn't speak for me. If the chair does it right, 
then presumably they can speak in terms of what the committee is doing, what the committee is deliberating about, the decisions it has made, without blurring the line between the chair stating their opinion about something as opposed to speaking truly on behalf of the committee as a whole. It's a tough high wire act, as I'm sure the chairs in the room would agree. So let's talk about meetings. You heard sort of the open meeting law stuff, and that's obviously the most important thing to adhere to. But tell me, certainly in this climate that we're in with very polarized political debates, school committees have become, school committee meetings have become sort of center stage uh, in some cases for the circus and where people come to debate things that may have nothing to do with your schools, uh, but it's where the political drama plays out. So let's talk just a few quick ideas about how do you keep school committee meetings from going off the rails and remaining somewhat civil? What are some of the strategies that you've tried that you found effective? Anybody? Yes. I think it's just allowing people to talk as long as they maintain professionalism and, and respect. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you said a few good things there. One, I just want to unpack a few of them. One, um, making clear what the rules are up front, if you will. Um, it's sometimes good to explain them at the start of every public comment period. We're going to allow 30 minutes. Every speaker gets three minutes. We'll let you know when there's a minute remaining. Uh, whatever those rules may be. Um, and adhering to those rules evenly with every speaker, whether they are there to sing your praises or tear you a new one, the same rules apply, right? Now, you may also know that you have the, the option to change those rules in a given meeting because of the circumstances. We know we have a lot of people here who want to speak on a certain topic, so we're going to make it down to two minutes per speaker, or we're going to expand to an hour of public comment. Whatever it may be, just being really clear about that up front and being consistent. Something else you said is, I'm paraphrasing here, but never let them see you sweat. Like, not engaging and letting your emotions take over, even if the public shows up with very heated emotions and is screaming at you and calling you names. Um, again, being really clear about what the rules are. Um, to me, I'll take that a little bit further and say, I don't believe you should ever respond to public comment in any way, shape, or form. I know districts that part of their agenda will be public comment, response to public comment, and I just want to cross it off. Don't respond to public comment, because you've got to respond to everyone or no one. I think it's part of the problem. And is it really doing any good? So as painful as it is, I leave public comment for the public. Let them say their piece. Um, it's not a place to ask questions of the committee. There are other forms for that. Um, don't shake your head. Don't roll your eyes. Don't stare, look over at other members and with the, can you believe this face? Um, be professionals and just sit there, take it all in, suck, bite your teeth if you have to, not visibly, um, and ride it out. Yes. Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying about having multiple means of listening to your public. Um, that if the school community are the only, is the only place that they can go to have their grievances aired, and there is no give and take, as I'm saying there should not be, then they're going to say, well, this is, well, that was my only shot at this. But if there are other legitimate opportunities at the school level, at the district level, to provide that engagement, then you're able to say, you know, this, isn't, this is a business meeting. We're here to hear you out, but this, is, this isn't a chance for sort of back and forth about X, Y, and Z. You may, not, you may need to have a town hall about a particular topic that's important to the community where there is more of that interaction. I don't know, it sort of depends on the issue, um, but I think to me, the, the response to the public not feeling heard is not to try to have any kind of conversation from a dais to a room like this. It's just, it's such a slippery slope. Um, but to me, it doesn't feel sustainable. And to your first point, you know, we had a norm in Boston with my first superintendent who was just so good at this kind of stuff. 
And he's made an expectation for everyone on his team. So we all went to school committee meetings, of course. But if you were the director of facilities and someone gets up and says, there's a roof leaking at my kid's school, not just to say someone will get back to you, but his expectation was when that parent goes back to their seat, the director of facilities gets out of her seat and goes over and says, let me take your name and number, which room is leaking, I'm gonna follow up with you. So that was true for me as a communications person, the special ed person, the food and nutrition person, whatever. His expectation for customer service, I will call it, was that we followed up on the spot. Yes, somebody else had a comment about meetings, I think. So I hand up, no, okay. If it's appropriate, yeah. Yeah, or I'll talk to the chair. Or I'll talk to the chair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think um, the, I caught part of the presentation from the AG's office that was, I think, really useful. And one of the things that people often find surprising is there is no obligation to have public comment. But if you do, then you have, do have certain obligations. I'm not trying to be a lawyer here because I'm not. But just to share with you, this, there was a pretty significant case in Massachusetts that I think involved the Natick School Committee where they had pretty, I would say, tight rules about what people could and couldn't say in public comment. They had sort of vague language about anything that's uh, inappropriate or outside the scope of the meeting or something. Um, and they got sued and the plaintiffs won. Um, and the plaintiffs basically said, you're violating our First Amendment rights because your rules are either not clear or they're discriminatory or leave too much discretion to what the chair decides is or isn't appropriate. And it's sending ripples through the whole state where school communities are saying, geez, are we doing that? And looking at what Natick has had to do as a result in order to give people the latitude to say a lot of different things at school committee meetings, short of threatening members or talking about individual students and so on. So this is a shifting landscape at times too. This is not sort of truly cut and dried, yeah. Wow, brave. <laughs> Good. The people of Warwick are more civil than. <laughs> yeah. My uh, my job with the school committee was called executive secretary, sort of like the staff director, and I had that lovely job for five years of being one minute remaining. Your time is up. <laughs> keeping the I would have wake up in cold sweats of like, oh my god, they're all over their time. Um, not fun. So I, I'm impressed you were able to get away with that. I'm not get, uh, pull that off, I should say. Um, so, and again, someone sort of mentioned this, but I think public comment should be a good barometer, and if something is important enough that it's coming up, to make sure you follow up with the superintendent. What you do have control over is the agenda. So you may come back at the next meeting, as this member said, and say, we're going to have a presentation about this, and the committee is going to deliberate, and that's the public's chance to maybe find out that you truly heard what they shared or didn't. Um, but it's not at that same meeting. It's about sort of being strategic about how you sequence these things. Crisis communication, again, we could spend hours talking about this, but I have to just at least allude to it. In most cases, the crises that I see fall within the superintendent's purview, especially the day-to-day -day stuff. The crises, leave them to the superintendent if they are stuff about buildings and stuff that's going on during the school day, safety issues. I think sometimes the school committee says, but the whole town's talking about it, we've gotta get involved. No, you don't necessarily. That's a perfect example of when the right spokesperson is the operational person, the superintendent or her designee, okay? Now, there are obviously other communications or other crises, I should say, that are very much in your lane, especially if there's a crisis about the superintendent who does work for you, or there's a legal matter that involves the school committee, or some of these other high profile things that we've seen that involve students and violation of policies or staff and violation of policies. That's where it's appropriate for the school committee to get involved. But again, to partner with the superintendent on a very concerted response, assuming it's not about the superintendent herself, um, and making sure that there's sort of a unified response and everyone figuring out what their job is during this crisis and is not during this crisis, okay? So obviously this is Pandora's buck end. We could have an entire session or day just about this. But there are a few things I do want to share with you about social media. Um, one, I know that it sometimes feels like your worst enemy and you may just wish it had never been invented. We all have those days. I still believe um, that it has a role to play, not just in our culture, but in school districts and that school districts who are not using social media in some form or another are extracting yourselves from a conversation that's gonna happen without you. 
And all these Facebook groups among the neighbors, you know them, they're going to exist, and there's always going to be unhappy parents. The question is, is the school department, school department on Facebook and or Twitter, Instagram, whatever works for you, telling a different story and getting those good stories out, telling your big picture, reminding people about your goals, your priorities, your investments. So there's that whole piece. But what about when social media gets ugly? I think the school committee often says, what is our role in all this? I'll tell you some basic principles that I have found effective. One, the school committee should not have its own social media accounts, period. To me, that's just a no-brainer. And I see districts where the school committee has an account and the superintendent has an account, and I say, this is dysfunctional. Whatever the school committee thinks it needs to share with the public can be done through the district's official account about your meetings, your votes, all the stuff we've talked about today. I never want to depict that you guys are two different entities, but rather two parts of a larger organization as you are. Two, um, got to be really careful. Again, I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer here, but how you behave as individual school committee members and as a board. Um, I, my general advice is not to weigh in on things as a school committee member when even if a neighbor posts something that says, we don't offer any arts in this district, and you know that's insane, but you're not going to go in there and say, this is insane, we have music, we have whatever, so on and so on. It's really tempting, but it's a slippery slope, and I would say a very dangerous one. Um, partially for legal reasons, because you don't want to get into the business of violating open meeting law with your activities on social media, especially if there is a quorum online, but also the perception piece. And again, how come you responded to this person's question on Twitter, but not mine? Or how come you engaged on that topic? And to me, it's just such a firestorm waiting to happen. Um, I do believe that you can use social media as a barometer um, to see sort of where the community is, to find out what is truly on people's minds, to find out perhaps what is escalating to the level of crisis, as opposed to just someone's grumblings. Sometimes the superintendent will call me on Monday morning and said, Oh my God, social media blew up over the weekend over this thing. I said, okay, let's, let's talk more about that. What does blown up mean? Oh, 12 people are losing their minds. <laughs> and I'm not dismissing it because it does feel awful, like you're, you're a superintendent or, or whatever, and if there are 12 people saying all this hateful or inaccurate stuff, it feels like a lot, but I have to sometimes remind them it's 12 people. If that becomes 120, maybe we should talk, not because there's a tipping point, but because common sense would say, let's find out how real or not real this thing is. Um, again, not to engage on social media, but to say there's enough noise around this that we need to talk to the superintendent and figure out whether we should have a presentation at school committee meeting about our investment in the arts, for example, and set the record straight that way rather than commenting on someone's post. Or a post of your own from your site, meaning the school district site, I mean account, about your investment in arts education. Find out what's on them, what people's minds, set the record straight in your way rather than in their arena. Okay. Two, I think sometimes we don't give our stakeholders enough credit, especially our families, and we think just because someone said something on Facebook that everyone's going to believe it. I believe that we are more intelligent and discerning and perhaps skeptical than that. And sometimes we don't give our parents enough credit to say, they don't buy all this. My sister has three kids who are either now or have gone through the Lincoln Public Schools, and she's on Facebook, and she, I think she's a very typical sort of working mother in many ways, where she just will just roll her eyes at a lot of this stuff. And she doesn't take it all with a, at face value, but says, oh yeah, this person says the middle school is no good, but she's a nut, or whatever. Like, just give people some credit, and not like because it was said, everyone in town is gonna believe it. Um, I think sometimes a little reality check like that may help sort of de-escalate some things. Three, we talked about which accounts, who should have them, who should not. Be really careful with your own accounts. Um, and I realize sometimes when you're running for school committee, you want to have a, an account about the campaign. Just being careful not to sort of blur the lines between how you're using that account and the work that you're doing as a school committee member as part of the team. Um, and then commenting, I sort of alluded to this already, but to me, it's just a big no-no. And it's going to seem like there are times when you're like, I'm just going to jump in for a second and then jump right back out. <laughs> Who's ever done that successfully, right? It's just not realistic or sustainable. Again, I realize this is probably Pandora's box, but 
social media, questions, comments, frustrations, what do, you, what do you want to hear or know? Yes, it's a chance to tell some of the good stories, but I also don't want you to be accused of only telling good stories. And I'm always reminding districts who are trying to manage something and um, sometimes to disclose something, to do it on social media too, to be truly transparent, to build that trust so parents aren't gonna just say, oh yeah, they've got a Facebook page, but that's just, you. if you just read that, you think it's all wine and roses, as opposed to, oh yeah, they did share that there was an incident and how they managed it, or that something's coming down the pike, or our test scores aren't where they need to be. I am all about warts and all, and that's how you build community trust, as opposed to just being the Pollyanna who tells good stories. That's when you're accused of having a PR office instead of a true communications office. Anybody else on social media? Okay. Um, I've thrown a lot at you in a short time. Questions, comments about communications, strategic communications in general, uh, about school committee's role. Yes, in the back. Um, actually, it's about social media. Yeah. What happens when you have like, your parent organizations that kind of take over and run wild and they become like the de facto information centers, yet they're not really the schools? They're an outside organization that has a partner with the school. Yeah. But they're really running the narrative, they're running the controlling. That's what parents go to find their information. That's like, like, how do we kind of get everyone to move off of those sites that they're now so used to? Because Um, I, I don't, there's no magic wand about that. I would say you're never going to get them to go off those pages. I would want those pages to become less relevant because they're not filling a vacuum. What I hear in your question is that those pages are providing a service that for whatever reason the district is not. Especially if they're providing information about things that parents need to know. That should be that barometer that says, why aren't we doing that? Why doesn't the school's Facebook presence strong enough that people don't need the PTO to tell them there's a dance this Friday? or that there's a new math curriculum. Um, to me, it's always about filling that vacuum. So, um, could, I, two other things. One, I think it's worth a conversation with the PTO about how that page can be useful or not useful, if it's, especially if some of the information is not accurate or not helpful. They may decide to keep doing what they're doing or they may not, but it sometimes just helps to have that conversation. And they may say, well, if only the principal would do X, Y, and Z, we wouldn't have to spend so much time doing this stuff. This is based on a very rough diagnosis of the problem you're sharing, but was that your question as well? Yeah. Thanks. It's a really good question. Other questions, comments, frustrations about communications? Yes. Yeah. She say, what do you do about fake Twitter accounts? I don't know. I knew what I would have done six months ago or a year ago um, when there were rules. About, I mean, you would still report it. But the question is, has Twitter changed enough that they just say, we can't shut them down? At some point, it may be a legal thing, though. Well, you may have the ability, if you want to take on Elon Musk, to, uh, folks, can I just get your attention? We have a couple more questions. Um, and really try to take them on and say, with, they are posing as a district that they're not and getting misinformation, it's dangerous to parents and staff. Yes, any other questions, comments? If not, I'm the only thing standing between you and happy hour or whatever your night involves. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great point, and it's really important to, to frame what that position is and isn't. Again, if it's a PR office, I would say to the district also, no, we're not paying for that. But if it's that two-way communication where the, the value is in the public being able to feel more engaged and invested, harder to say no to that. Tim, thank you. Thank you all. Good luck in your new role.